Karen de la Carrier was a member of the Church of Scientology for 35 years and was married to its president. Uh, she held a level of enlightenment and a rank within the organisation shared by only a handful of others and rubbed shoulders with the church's elite, including people like John Travolta. But she questioned the leadership and, she says, was brutally punished for it. Let's talk to Karen now, who's on the phone to us uh, from the States. Good morning, or for you, very early morning, Karen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Bill. Um, let's start back at the beginning, I suppose. Uh, where did you first of all come across the Church of Scientology? I believe it was in London. That wasn't Little Place in Tottenham Court Road, was it, by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> you know the Tottenham Court Road. Actually, they had a little mission there, um on Baker Street. Um, I used to live behind Herod's. I was, went to the Lycée Francaise along. It was a sort of most of my younger life was in London. And um, yeah, I, I guess I, I believed in reincarnation and mm -hmm. I found uh, something that validated reincarnation and I was hooked. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, now, to get hooked uh, on Scientology, you, f you can't just kind of join, can you? You have to go through certain procedures. And I believe that uh, the first thing is called a pre-clear. Is that correct? Yes. Bill, you know, in the 70s, it was far more loosey-goosey. But you asked a really good, pro good question. Right now, if some listener walked in the door of a, of a, of a Scientology organisation... They have to sign four unconscionable contracts. You immediately sign that this is a church, that this is religious, you understand you're joining a religion, and on and on and on, and you sign that you can never say anything disparaging about the church ever. So your free speech, you can never talk to the media, you can never sue them, you can only take internal justice, internal arbitration. You can't do this, you can't do that. And these four contracts have to be signed before you even take one baby step in Scientology. That's fascinating. And I believe these contracts bind you uh, not only uh, for your lifetime, they bind you for around a billion years. That's a CO contract, correct? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, and, That's uh, a Sea Org contract. So explain to our listeners, Karen, what the, what, what, how does Sea Org fit into the Church of Scientology? What, what's the, the, the connection? The Sea Org would what you would call clergy. You know, the clergy mm -hmm. of any church are the ones that face outward to the public, right? Mm -hmm. And manage the whole the internal architecture of a church has to have staff. In Scientology, there are two types of staff, just five-year contracts, two-and-a-half-year contracts. Those are staff that live and go home to their families. Yep. Sea Org, which you sign for a billion years, as you correctly said, have to live on campus, have to wear uniform, have to follow orders almost like a military organization. You go where they tell you to, you pick up your suitcase, and you fly to... Australia and leave your wife behind and don't see her for the next five years. You do whatever the mother church says you do. And that's the billionaire, billion year contract you sign that you are there just to obey CO rules and regulations. Uh, part of those contracts w was published in an English newspaper uh, recently, uh, and if you don't mind, Karen, I'd just like to read out uh, one of the parts of these contracts, which says, if, circumstan yes. if circumstances ever arise in which government, medical or psychiatric officials or personnel or family members or friends attempt to compel or coerce or commit me for psychiatric evaluation, treatment or hospitalisation, I fully expect that the church will intercede on my behalf to oppose such efforts and or extract me. That's an extraordinary clause. Bill, you know that's permission for them to lock you up. There was this catastrophic incident of a young 31-year-old in Clearwater who attested to the state of clear and then took off all her clothes and walked naked on Fort Harrison Avenue and the police were bewildered and put her in a nearby hospital, a big state-of-the-art hospital, Morton Plant, and immediately Scientologists came, grabbed her out of the 
hospital and said, no, 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 she couldn't have psychiatric observation. It was against the religion. They locked her up in a room at the Fort Harrison, and 21 years, 27 days later, this beautiful 31-year-old was dead. And the autopsy photos are on the web. They're pretty grotesque. Her name was Lisa McPherson. Mm -hmm. And let me explain why this happens, Bill. People can't fathom why. Why? Mm. Let me tell you why. Scientology sells a very high spiritual attainment. We're going to get you more enlightened, more ethical, more, more, more wisdom, more... We're just going to make you attain your higher self. You're going to reach upward. You're going to have different states of consciousness. You're going to leave your body and be look at Earth from different dimensions, blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Now, when somebody goes absolutely crazy within the confines of the church due to a hundred different reasons, the church is embarrassed. Mm -hmm. It's an embarrassment. How could Lisa McPherson attest a high spiritual state of clear, and then three weeks later take off her clothes and walk naked. That sounds like she didn't go clear. She's nuts. I mean, who walks naked down a very busy avenue? So that shows that you're a little bit uh, cuckoo. So Scientology is embarrassed that it can take hundreds of thousands of takes. <laughs> this is a pay-as-you-go religion. Yes. It costs every hour you sit down. It's Five hundred dollars, or it can be eight hundred dollars, and then when the results go drastically wrong, the reason there's that clause, they want to lock you up and bring you back to normality because it's bad PR, Bill. Mm -hmm. It's bad PR. Look at the public relations nightmare. You're taking a hundred thousand dollars from someone to give this elite, elite, high, high, you know, high religious church you know, ecstatic state, and then you do something crazy, mm. like uh, the incident in Salt Lake City, Utah, of Rex Fowler, he blew the brains out of his employee uh, after being in the church 40 years and doing every level by the book. This is embarrassing. to A church, if, if they're selling wisdom and they're selling an enlightened human being. How can an enlightened human being act crazy? Do you see the? Yeah, I do. do you I, see why that would be embarrassing? Yeah. Let's let's try and get a sense of how you can get from being an, a normal everyday person to, to this state where you do walk down the middle of the street naked uh, or, or blow somebody's brains out. Um, in your situation, as you say, it was a lot easier for you uh, to get in uh, originally. You signed a couple of simple forms. You got in. You very quickly um, uh, then uh, progressed, didn't you? Really. You you reached supervisor status really quickly within three years, and uh, you then were a golden couple with um, Haber Yench, I hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, who eventually got made international president. Yes. Yes, uh, the church has definitely morphed. You know, organ people can change. Organizations can change. Entities can change. Good, credible businesses can go awry and falsify stuff for shareholders, and they turn out to be a criminal, you know, it, it does happen. When I, when I had this big high-speed rise to the top, the church was more benign, emphatically mm. more, less, uh, less punitive, less, it has morphed into practically a sadism, which <laughs> is beyond belief. They have, um, in the hierarchy, in the absolute highest uh, campus that they have where the leader of the church, David Miscavige, lives and all his lieutenants and all the hierarchy, they have something called the dungeon. The law, law enforcement call it a dungeon. And senior execs are sent in there and they're not allowed to... Lately, they've softened it up, but they have to sleep on the floor with no pillows. They weren't allowed out except twice a week to take a shower. They had bars on the window... They had to do seances where they screamed at each other to give up crimes. I mean, it sounds like one flew over the cuckoo's nest. It doesn't sound religious. It doesn't sound ecclesiastical. It sounds like a kind of a loony bin. Let me tell you, it has morphed into that, Bill. It's just 
unreal what goes on behind the closed doors of the church. And in your view, uh, Karen, has it morphed into that because uh, when L. Ron Hubbard passed, uh, the reins uh, passed on to David Miscavige, who you've mentioned there? Yes, very much so. Um, David Miscavige took... There, there was always punishments in the church, always, even in the 70s. But they were mild and they were fast. If you had to, if you had to clean toilets and mop vacuum floors because you were being disciplined, it, it, it could last a week and then it was all forgiven and you were back on. Now, when you're sent to the gulag, you could be in there for years. Years, Phil. Mm. You, when you're in the rehabilitation project force, you're cut off from your wife. You can't speak to anyone, not even family, not your mom, not dad. You're cut off from the outside world into this black hole of other... And you're being disciplined. And this can go on for three to five years. It is grim. It is... And what happens is people flee. That it just It's a revolving door. People have a threshold. They can't take this. <laughs> you reach mm. a threshold, and that's it. People like me, I'm telling you, Bill, there are more people like me outside the church than there are left in the Church of Scientology. Well, it's interesting you say that. We spoke uh, on the show about six months ago, I guess, uh, to a name you'll be familiar with, Mike Rinder, uh, who was... Oh, the... really? Yes, yes, we had Mike on the show. Yeah, Friend of mine. He, uh, he was a, he was a know, great, we great back guy to interview. Years together. Well, I'm sure you do. Yeah, and, we... He was certainly backing up everything you're saying, and in particular, he was saying it was very curious that it was the kind of hierarchy who were being punished by being put in this whole place, you know, uh, yes. uh, uh, and yes. he found that very odd. And in the end, of course, as you know, uh, Mike left the church, as did other uh, very high-ranking people like Marty Rathburn, yes. uh, all left the church, uh, and they all kind of uh, blamed the way it's being led by their former boss, David Miscavige, although they still believe in the principles of Scientology and, and, and Mike Rinder says to this day he still does yes there's, you go through a decompression kind of you know and then you slowly sort of wake up and you slowly m many people who still believe in some of that as they read the internet as they study the YouTube videos as they listen to interviews like like you're doing now, slowly, slowly, people kind of wake up to what they possibly weren't totally looking at. Um, you know, human beings want to be better. There's a natural yearning in a human being. I want to, I want to improve. If, if, if there's something that brings out my higher self and mm. better, I want to be a better human being. Do I have weak... Oh, I'd like to have better relationships. I'd like to be higher and better. And the pitch in Scientology is, we will make you this elite, super intelligent, higher... You'll, we'll take you up higher. Just give us your cash. Give money now. And uh, pay for this now. And we will just hold our hand. And we will take you up there. Well, Bill... The horror stories. See, we live in a digital age of Twitter and YouTube yep. and message boards and Facebook. And all. The dirty little secrets that were so easily hidden in the 1970s, even 80s, the Internet. Now, some explosive incident happens and it travels at the speed of, you know. Yeah. It, it, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube. Or sure. should I say, you cannot unring the bell. I'm talking to you now. Guess what? People who didn't hear it, it's on podcast. It's on iTunes. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. The the word is out, and you cannot unring the bell. And this is giving many many people um, a, a hard look at at before they are lured in. And uh, I don't want anyone to go through what what I did. So I speak out. I I, want, I don't want anyone to. No mother should have to suffer her 27-year-old die because the church enforced him to disconnect and shun me. 
Yeah. Yes, let, let's let's talk about your circumstances because I, I think it was kind of back in the early eighties that you started to kind of question what was going on around you. Uh, how did you get from the point there uh, to a point where you actually managed to leave the church? Uh, and on the way, some of the some of the things you're saying happened to you are unbelievable. I mean, you were made to run. At, and then correct me if this is wrong. Twelve hours a day for three months, and then had to chip paint off a metal pole day after day. Bill, you are so well informed. I just can't believe how much homework you do before you have a guest on. My I think goodness. it's only fair. You're if, you're, of... if you're going to go to the trouble of getting up in the middle of the night to talk to me, I think it's only fair that I do my <laughs> part as well, Karen. <laughs> you certainly are impressive. Look, I was... In, this is a culture of blame. There's always pointing the finger. Somebody did something. You know, in, in the culture of blame, Bill, it's... it's in Scientology, there are no errors. There are no mistakes. There are only criminal acts. If you mess up, it's because you had an evil intention to harm all of Scientology. Mm. <laughs> That's the culture. In other words, nobody inadvertently made a minor mistake. There's no mistakes in Scientology. If an error was done, find the evil in that person. Anyway, long story short, they found I would, found something wrong with me, and I was sentenced to run around a pole. Like, you. No, look, nobody can run twelve hours a day, even <laughs> no. if you're a marathon runner. Uh, no, you just can't. You hobble. Your knees are swollen. Your ankles are in pain. You hobble along, but it was torture. And I'll tell you, Bill, there's good and bad in everything. I'm learning this more and more. The bad was I was went through the torture. The good was. It was a wake-up call. Mm. I saw the darker underbelly of the church. I thought, what is this? This is what I signed a billion years of my life on an entity that can just, in a New York second, sentence me to run around a pole in clear water heat in the middle of summer for till my... An- in other words, it was a wake-up. That was the good side of it, right? Yes. So... When I had a couple of these really drastic, torturous incidents, I was done. That was, you know, I, I, uh, I, I, I no longer felt, I felt that I didn't quite know what I was doing, what I was signing a billion-year contract for. This was not, the, the organization had changed. It, you know, and I think journalists like you, radio interviewers like you, find this so fascinating because... How can good and bad be sandwiched together? How can something perpetrating to be religious and ecclesiastical, how could that also be so incredibly harmful? I mean, when good and bad are muddled into one ball, it's provocative. You think, what wall? (laughs) Mm. (laughs) Where is the deception? Something doesn't add up, correct? How can a church be cruel? Isn't a church supposed to be benign and a safe harbor, a safe space where you can go in and meditate and think about... Not not punishment, not sadism, not abuse, not whipping and clobbering its members. Well, it wouldn't be the first church to to have uh, been accused of abusing its members, that's for sure. Uh, We we certainly can't nail that on them. Tell tell me, uh, Karen... uh, about the man David Miscavige, I mean, I read a quote of yours where he basically said that you sat across a desk from him and his eyes were as cold as steel. Uh, what What is he like? David Miscavige is brutal. He ascended to power in a coup, a very, very a purge, a coup. It was like a, like a like in Latin America where there's a junta and the military, does, you know, a coup, an absolute mm. coup. Uh, the church was actually left to another person called Pat Broker, who is a close, close uh, assistant of L. Ron Hubbard and who had lived with L. Ron Hubbard for the last six years of his life. He had one, one break from it, but more or less he was right there. And he and his wife were, were supposed to take over the church. David Miscavige hired two ex-cops, two ex-police officers who were now private investigators to stalk him and follow him for 25 years of his life. Miscavige was worried that 
Fat could contend and come back and take over the church in another coup or power push, $12 million of Parishna money was spent hiring private investigators to pursue Pat Broca. They got his phone records. They knew what girl he was dating. If a girl had a sleepover, they knew the name of the girl who slept in his bed. They looked through his mail. They knew every person he ever talked to. They were private investigators. But here's a church leader using $12 million of Parishna money to stalk and follow his would-be rival who could possibly come back. David May, David Miscavige's real fear was that Pat Broker could, you know, make a power play and come back and combat him. Mm. So he was stalked for 25 years. But anyway, when you say, what is David Miscavige? He, he's addicted to power. He's, he rules all of Scientology with a dark hand and iron heart. His word is law. It's it's electric. Like people quake when he walks in a room. Um, mm. He was asking. He was asking an assistant of his. Well, how are they when I'm a little late? How how? And she said to him, "Sir, they they shaking in their boots. They they don't know what mood you'll be in." And he laughed. He he actually gets a kick out. You know the saying, "Bill, absolute power corrupts." Oh yes, absolutely. That is David Miscavige. He has power. The sheep and the Kool-Aid drinkers that, you know, obey his every women fancy. And he has taken power and he, uh, he rules. But for how long? For how long? Well, some of the things I've, I've read that, that he said to you, uh, and you can again tell me if these are correct quotes or not, that he would bring you down to the lowest of the low and you were to hit the decks, basically, uh, um, which are extraordinary things to say to a human being. Well, I got punished. I got punished by being summoned to the, this campus where, where I explained to you was, and Mike Rinder talked to you about SP Hall, the, the hierarchy, right? Yeah. And the chief of security was told, now, it was handed over. And, and by the way, he's out as well. He was chief of security, Gary Moorhead. He'd be a lot of fun for you to interview with mm. you. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, he said, he said um, uh, wear her manicured fingers to the bone. Mm. And Gary said it was blood curdling when he heard, when Miscavige says, work her on the decks and wear wear out her manicured fingers to the bone. That was a wink and a nod that mm. you punish this chick and you lay it on the line. Um, so that was an om ominous thing only because he holds so much power. Yeah. If he if he just takes a so comments about the weather, people listen with a hush. He's, he's a, like taken as kind of supremacy or like a Almost like a Henry VIII that can just say off with her head and mm. boom, she's sent to the tower. You know, that kind of yeah. overwhelming power. Well, Miscavige doesn't have empathy for an, He can't feel, he can't feel what another human being feels. He's in some glorified universe where he is supreme. Karen, we've got, unfortunately, two minutes exactly left. What would you like okay. to happen now uh, in terms of the Church of Scientology? It has to lose tax exemption. It must. It wouldn't last six months as a business with this kind of... You can't charge... You can't treat working stuff... If you were a business, right? Mm. It clearly has is a fraud. As a religion... It reverse engineered itself. It quickly studied what the IRS say is a religion. And then it went and implemented. Have Sunday services. Wear, put crosses up. Put, put a cross. Have a moral code. It's a way to have, you know, quickly, quickly do these things. And then you qualify as a religion. Remember all the early books, Bill, they didn't have the word church or religion. It said modern science of mental health, mm. science of survival, church of religious science. Everything was supposed to be scientific. Well, then, <laughs> to mm. meet IRS criteria, it became a church overnight. So uh, once it loses its tax exemption, 
then it has, I don't want to have the church destroyed. I want it to stop abusing people. We want the abuses, like Mike Rinder, I want the abuses to stop. Yeah. And if it lost tax exemption, then it wouldn't be able to be abusive. And that's all I want. I want the abuses to stop, and that will stop when it loses tax exemption. They've dismissed you, as you know, uh, as being like a lunatic who spreads falsehoods because you have a personal axe to grind. But rather interestingly, you're not saying anything different than, than Mike Rinder said. Well, thank you, Bill. They, you know, they, <laughs> uh, they make up stuff on any whistleblower. You know, they, they studied me from head to toe looking for crimes like I had some hidden cr they couldn't come up with any crimes so basically just name you know I speak the truth and I have uh, three and a quarter million views on my YouTube channel mm. in one year four months 11,000 subscribers and three and a quarter million people watched my YouTube in just over one year I have a voice yeah and the church doesn't like my voice, so, uh, you know, to just kind of toss it off, you know. Yeah. Well, That's okay. I, uh, as I said at the start of the program, Karen, uh, all I want to do is, is to get our guests on and to tell their story uh, in their own yes. words, and then our listeners yes. can make their own mind up. Uh, and, if, exactly. and if the opposition side, in this case the Church of Scientology, wish to, to refute those allegations, the floor is theirs, uh, and I'll happily get somebody. We've had somebody on before, but they refused to answer any of the questions I asked them. I had to write down the questions, uh, you know, in a very specific manner. I'll happily get somebody on from the Church of Scientology uh, to, to, to put their side of, of the allegations that you make against them and, and to tell me what, what their yes. view is. I've got no problem with that, yes. but it's very difficult to get them no. to do that. <laughs> Bill, you see, if, if you have nothing to hide, then why can't you just answer hard questions? If you have nothing to hide, then why should the questions be pre-written? It's a good you're point. Worried about, you're worried about hard hard journalistic questions that you can't answer. And I would be delighted for the church to, to respond to each and every thing I have told you. They never deny forcing me to run around a poll 12 hours a day. They never deny that they, you know, most of the head, head points, they didn't, well, they're kind of denying that they have SP Hole, which is ridiculous, mm. because my husband, the president of Church of Scientology International, my ex-husband, was in it for seven years. Good Lord. Seven years. Well, Karen, we're, we're sadly literally out of time now. I'd, I'd love to talk to you yeah. more, and I'm, and I'm sure we'll get you back on. I really appreciate you coming on, firstly, in the middle of the night in the States, and your honesty, uh, and I, as I said, I'd love to get you back on again. Bill, you were a great interviewer. My oh, bless pleasure. you. Thank Take you care. so much, okay. Karen. All the best you to you. You were great. Thank you, Bill. Best you were great. Thank you, Bill. Best you were great. Thank you.